Welcome to this great assembly. About 51 years ago, uh, some of the people in this room moved into this valley to live and practice together. Before we moved in, this room was a hay barn. And we took the hay out and uh, started practicing in this room. Over those years, in this valley, in this room, we have spoken of uh, the suffering of this world. We have acknowledged it and vowed to listen to it and observe it with compassion. And in this room over those years, we have said, we have recited, we have listened to vows, vows of those who wish to become Buddha in order to help this ocean of living beings. Later today, we will say those vows four vows, four universal vows. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. We vow to save them. Afflictions are inexhaustible. We vow to cut through. Dharma gates, gates to the truth, are boundless. We vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. We vow to become it. Uh, we call these bodhisattva vows for those who are in the process of realizing perfect awakening. Uh, these vows are quite similar to the vows of those who have realized awakening. Those who have fully realized it are called Buddhas. Buddha is a Sanskrit word originally, which means awakened or awakened one. The root word, the root of the word is bud, which means to awake. So the Buddha is the past participle of bud. And the word bodhi, which means awakening, is also based on this root. And the, the name bodhisattva is bodhi, again, awakening, uh, awakening and sattva, a being a being of awakening or a being in the process of awakening. So the Buddha also has vows, had vows and has vows, but you might say the Buddha's vows a little differently. Rather than become the Buddha way, the Buddhas maintain the Buddha way. And rather than uh, enter all Dharma gates, they have entered. And rather than cut through, they, they are, they have cut through all afflictions and liberated all beings. So in this valley, we often say these vows. We also say in this room often, we speak of our unceasing effort to free all beings so they may dwell in peace and harmony. 
we speak of that unceasing effort. We aspire to that unceasing effort. And we have a practice that we do in this valley and in this room. It is the practice of realizing these vows, it is the practice of the Buddha way. And also we have a, a family style word or two words that we use to uh, express the whole Buddha way, the whole way of freeing beings so they may dwell in peace and so on. And we call this practice just sitting. And last, last time I gave a talk on Sunday here, I also talked about just sitting, our practice, or the practice of the Buddha way that we speak of. And I said, I think, during that talk, I said that this just sitting is a radiant conversation. It's a conversation between each of us and all Buddhas. It's a conversation between each of us and all beings. Our, the just sitting includes everyone in conversation, everyone in wholehearted communion. That's the just sitting. Since it's not, since it's a conversation, since it's a communion, we don't do the communion. It's done together. We together enter the communion. In reality, we do. And even though in reality, we are entering this communion moment after moment, we need to actually offer our moment by moment human activity to what we're already doing. We need to offer our body, speech, and thought to this conversation. Otherwise, even though it's always going on, we don't realize it. That might be called an irony. That we maybe don't, it's kind of ironic that we, we are, it is necessary that we do something that we're already doing. That we offer what we're doing to what we're already do, doing in reality. When we sit in this room and any room, when you sit, you can offer your sitting. You can offer your posture, your sitting posture as a token of everything. This individual body is offered as a token to the just sitting of the Buddha. This sitting, every moment of this sitting, is an homage to the Buddha, which is an homage to the conversation between Buddha and all sentient beings. So the sitting is a token to a practice that concentrates all the practices of the Buddha way that have happened from beginningless time and are now happening all over the world in great variety. It collects and concentrates them all, or it concentrates on collecting them all. And this is called a meditation. It is called a samadhi, a state of gathering and collecting into one. One 
suchness, one the way things are, one universal, universal, vast and unhindered communion, which in this unhinderedness and vastness, it is radiant. It is ungraspable. There's no place to get a foothold. And it completely includes all beings who are grasping things and trying to get a foothold. And many people in many traditions do practices where they feel like they personally can do the practice by themselves and that they can grasp the practice and they can get a foothold in the practice. So some people may need to do a practice that they can grasp and they can get a foothold in order to open up to the practice that nobody can grasp and nobody can get a foothold to, the practice of the Buddhas. I can't grasp the Buddha's practice, and Buddha can't either. But Buddha is that practice. And I wish to enter the samadhi of the Buddhas, the concentration of the Buddhas, and live there. And living there is realizing it. To offer my graspable speech and thought and gestures as tokens to this samadhi. Again, in this samadhi, all the different practices that you may have heard about in the Buddha way and other traditions, they're all living together in harmony. They're not obstructing each other. They're, they're helping each other become the truth. Even unwholesome activity, and all kinds of delusions are in this samadhi. But in this samadhi, they are in conversation with awakening. Awakening is embracing them and sustaining them so that they may be free. Awakening is also embracing and sustaining all skillful, wholesome activity. It's embracing wholesome activity too. All the wholesome activities are in this samadhi called just sitting. And those wholesome activities, those wonderful, skillful, compassionate activities are also embraced and they're also liberated because even wholesome activities can be, a gra can be we can try to grasp them. Some people, without trying to grasp anything, surprise themselves and do something really lovely and wholesome. And they're very happy about that, and then they try to grasp it, which is a defilement of the goodness to grasp it. Rather than saying, thank you, you say, I'm going to keep it. Or rather than saying, just saying, thank you, try to get more. So the deluded mind can defile anything. However, that defilement in this samadhi is in intimate communion. And that communion is the samadhi, and that communion liberates all beings in the samadhi, which we call just sitting. But once again, uh, many people are not ready to just do a practice which is a token of everything. They want to do something. They want to do one or two things rather than be in a space where everything is happening and everything is included and, and everything is at peace. They're not ready for that. No, thank you. I want to do something that I can do by myself. I want to do something I can get a hold of. And in the Zen tradition, uh, we actually have, we offer many things that people can get a hold of because 
without giving them something they can get a hold of, they may not be ready to open to what they can't get a hold of. And actually Zen is um, somewhat famous for having uh, teaching techniques or teaching opportunities called koans, which are like public examples of awakening that people can be given in words or in writing, and they can contemplate these and they can get feedback from teachers about how to work with these stories, which they can initially, they feel like it, they can grasp. It's like someone might initially think they can grasp just sitting. But as you just sit, as you practice this just sitting, you gradually realize that it also is kind of like, it's ungraspable. This graspable offering is actually, actually ungraspable. So, the just sitting becomes another koan, if you want. What is the just sitting? Well, I just said what it was. It is the Buddha way. It is freeing all beings so they may dwell in peace. And this practice can occur in this room, and it can occur and live anywhere, because it includes anywhere, everywhere. It is, if you excuse me, it is everything. Everywhere, all at once. Our life is actually everything, everywhere, all at once. And just sitting celebrates the reality. I don't, remember, I don't remember who told me this, whether I read it or heard it, but it was kind of an imaginary um, interview between the founder of our school, Dogen Zenji, who lived in Japan long before there were talk shows. But so the image is kind of like somehow a talk show host managed to get this ancient teacher to come on his show and ask him questions about Zen. And the, the, the host said, I, I understand that you teach that uh, the Buddha way is just to sit or just sitting. And then Dogen Zenji said, yes, that's right. And then the, the host said, well, what about uh, the koan method and the koan techniques. And Dogen said, they're good. They're good. And the interviewer says, well, if they're good, why do you just, why do you just say that the practice is just sitting? And then the, the teacher Dogen says, well, some people have to do koans before they can just sit. After they do koans for a while, they're, they're actually able to just sit. And they can continue studying koans, but they're no longer studying koans by their own power. They're studying together with all beings. And they can open to that. And they need koans in order to open to it. But some people uh, don't, don't have koans to help them enter to it. So they may be want to switch to that other school. Where you can get something and do it by yourself. Leave me alone. Let me do this by myself. That's part of our evolution. We have, as children, we have to do that. Let me do it myself. There's this girl I take care of. Now she's a pretty big girl. She's almost 12. But when she was younger, she would try to do various things like uh, unscrew a jar or something. 
and then she might, might have some difficulty. And I would say, would you like me to help you? And she said, no, let me do it by myself. And then she would try. And sometimes she would succeed, and sometimes she would not. And if she didn't succeed, she sometimes would say, I need help. And I said, do you want me to help you unscrew it? And she said, yes, and then I would help her. But she had to uh, try herself to realize that she needs help to do certain things. And in this room also, and in other parts of this temple, we have formal ways of walking, sitting, bowing, chanting, eating, formal ways of doing these things. And um, and people come in here and try to learn those forms, but sometimes it takes a while before they can learn it or remember it. For example, when we walk formally in this room, we try to stand upright. And also, we put our hands into a um, particular mudra, hand mudra, which is we put our thumb down and wrap of our left hand and wrap the fingers around it like this. Then we place it uh, around our, our sternum, and we take the right hand and cover it. We put the thumb of the right hand on top of the crease behind the thumb of the left hand and place it here, and also hold the arms a little away, a little away from our body. And we walk in this posture. That's the, the formal way. And so people come in here, uh, and then they, they have their hands in other ways, like at their side, or they have this hand mudra down really low. Usually not really up really high. That's very common, uncommon to see this, this way of walking. Or even this, or this. This is more common. As it approaches the usual spot, it becomes more common. And then it goes below the usual stop, a spot and it becomes even more common. And then in this, so in this room, we're practicing just sitting while we're walking. In other words, we're walking as, as an offering to the Buddha Samadhi, to the, to the reality of the Buddha, where all beings are living together. We're walking as an offering to this Buddha way, to this Buddha Samadhi, to just sitting. And the just sitting helps us walk that way, and the walking helps us sit that way. I think it was quite recently, like last weekend, <laughs> we had a one day sitting here where people came and sat and walked in this room. And some of the people were, during the formal walking, their hands were in these kind of informal places. And uh, some of the senior people here were observing that, but they weren't sure, they weren't sure if they were invited to help to give people help. They weren't, sure, they weren't sure if they were invited to go up to some people who didn't seem to know or weren't practicing the formal way of walking. And they didn't feel invited to go up and say, do you need any help with your hands? So I think we're gonna have a little discussion here soon where we're gonna ask if the seniors are invited to give instruction to people about how to walk in the room if they seem to need it. The instruction comes from this samadhi. And because it comes from this masad, <laughs> samadhi, it is not given one-sidedly. It's given as a conversation. 
Do you need any help? Sometimes if you say that to people, they say, no, let me do it myself. <laughs> so the question is how to open up and maintain the conversation around these forms and how to use these forms as an opportunity for the conversation. Sometimes we also offer posture suggestions while people are sitting. However, we're careful to do that because we don't usually touch people without asking them. So we sometimes say, I would like, I, during this period of sitting quite a bit, we will offer postural suggestions. If you don't want them, let us know, we won't. And then we, and then if, if people are up for it, we gently put our hand on their back or the back of their neck or upper back, or lower back to, to make a suggestion about how to sit. Or we make a suggestion about how to hold their hands during the sitting. So we make these suggestions, but these suggestions are made in this respectful, intimate communion of the samadhi for the sake of realizing the samadhi, exercising it. Sometimes during, <clears throat> sometimes when I'm sitting and I'm also talking, I sometimes sing. And someone recently said to me, you know, it might be good if you got a pitch, a pitch pipe. <laughs> and actually I do have a piss pipe, <laughs> a, a pitch pipe. I do have one, but I forgot to bring it. So I'm going to sing this song, and I hope it isn't too irritating if I'm, on, if I'm off key. And it's a song about the way uh, enlightenment, radiant wisdom, interacts with delusion and confusion and affliction. It's a song about that, I feel. It's a song I heard when I was quite young, like seven or eight, but I remember it. And I liked it when I was seven or eight, and I still do. And now I see it in a new way. I see it as what is the way we relate when we're in samadhi, when we're in the Buddha way. <laughs> so please excuse me if this song is off key. Is that off key? <laughs> the, the evening breeze caress the trees tenderly. The trembling trees caress the breeze tenderly. That, that's the way it is in the samadhi. Everything is tenderly, respectfully, wholeheartedly embracing everything else. And that is the light of Buddha's wisdom, which frees all beings. It's always going on. It's a question of offering and uh, aligning with it and requesting it. And then by the power of that great Buddha wisdom, we enter the samadhi and we live there with all beings and do the work the very simple 
network, which is inseparable from infinite complexity. The one practice, this, this samadhi is the one practice samadhi. Just sitting is the one practice concentration. And it embraces infinite variety of practices. And again, just recently, someone said, we don't give much instruction in, in Zen compared to some other traditions of Buddhism. And I would say, actually, we do give instruction, detailed instruction when it's appropriate. We hope to. But sometimes we just say, one practice, let's all just sit. And then we discover that it's time to give some instruction about this or that or that or that or that or that or that. So that we both have the complexity and difference and we have oneness and they're working together in communion. So I ask if, um, you know, do you want me to help you with that? <laughs> and you might say, no, thank you. I, I'll do it by myself. Also, sometimes in this valley, we might see someone who looks lost. And we might say to them, excuse me, may I help you? And then they say, yeah, where's the Where's the kitchen? Where's the zendo? Where's the parking lot? And people often ask, where's the parking lot? They also say, what's the way to the beach? Where's the garden? So we see people and they seem to be calling out for help. So then we gently offer ourselves to assist them on their path. So I ask, do you need anything? Do you, do you need me to help you with anything? And that's just, what do you call it? <laughs> I was going to say that's a standing offer, but I think it's a sitting offer. It's a sitting offer. which is, may I help you? <laughs> also, just, uh, yeah, on Tuesday, I went to visit. I have a, I have a couple 90-year-old friends. They're older than me. <laughs> and the wife of one of my friends said, are you still teaching? And I said, what do you think? And then she said, oh, I mean, formally. And I said, yeah, yeah. I'm formally teaching. Like, this is kind of like formally teaching. But when I see somebody wandering around, it seems lost, and I say, may I help you? That's kind of, I guess, informally teaching, you might say. And sometimes what they, if they, they say, I'm looking for such and such, and sometimes I say, oh, I don't know where that is. So the way I teach sometimes is I say, I don't know. <laughs> so I just go on like this unless you say something. Yes. Thank you. I feel helped by the word token. And I wonder if you could help me understand that more fully. Yeah, token is like <clears throat> something offered as a represented as a representation of something else. So this posture is offered <clears throat> as a representation of Buddha's sitting. This this particular thing is a concrete phenomenal offering. 
as, it's offered as everything. This is the way I give everything. And I don't wish to, uh, you know, I don't wish to fix this up in order to make it a better offering. It's just this offering. Uh, if I thought that other way, I would want to make that an offering too. Did that address what you offered? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Did you ask for help? Please help. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ask for clarification? What did you ask for? Yeah, you kind of asked for something, didn't you? I did. I didn't feel too much like I was trying to get something. Um, I was asking for help to understand more fully what it would mean for me to understand my body sitting as a token. And um, we'll continue to sit with that. Yeah. So it's it it can you can you can have your sitting just be an offering to the Buddhas and to all sentient beings, but you can also recognize that it's an offering as a token also because you're actually offering it not only to the Buddhas but as the Buddhas. You're not only offering this body to all beings, but you're offering it as offering everything to all beings. So. Token is a type, maybe you could see that a special type of gift, which is meant to convey everything or, or something other than just its own simplicity. So we have a very simple practice, which is offered in a basically vast way. And I, I came back to you because I thought, well, he, this is the abbot of Zen Center, and if he can ask for help, <laughs> then maybe all of us can do it. It's not a sign of, I don't know what, I don't know, it's not a sign of, of like some insufficiency that you ask for help. It doesn't mean you're lacking when you ask for help. It doesn't mean you're trying to get anything when you ask for help. You're asking for help to give people an opportunity to help you. And people often do say to me, do you need any help? Or do you need help with something? And I often think, I need help with everything. And that pretty much ends the conversation. But I do, I need help with everything. And it's given to me. So everything I do is support because it's all beings are helping me. So if you ask me, do I need help with something? Yes, with everything, everywhere, all the time. Yes. See that the abbots and former abbots are asking questions. Isn't that something? I also had a question about token. Because I immediately thought of a subway token, mm -hmm. this little thing. Yeah. So a subway token gets you into this vast mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. right? Yep. You can go anywhere. <laughs> so it's more than it's more than just a little yeah, it's sphere. More than just a little piece of material. Yeah, it's it's a material that you can redeem redeem for in an infinite system, and you can offer it that way. And maybe the first thing you get is a ride on the subway, but or a bus. But it actually can be redeemed for everything in this particular token. So that was the first thing I thought about tokens. The second was like giving someone a gift and saying, this is a token yeah, of exactly. my appreciation. Exactly. So this flower bouquet, but what I hear you saying is the flower bouquet is symbolic of something that's inconceivable, token yeah. of my, yeah. but also is the inconceivableness itself. Yeah. Is. So, yeah, so I offer this, these flowers as a token of my appreciation. But I also offer these fl this, these flowers as offering you everything as a token of my appreciation. So I I want to offer you flowers, but I I also want to offer you much more. 
I want to offer everything for my appreciation, but I use the flowers as a token. And tomorrow, maybe I'll use, uh, I'll shine your shoes as a token of my appreciation. All the things we do are tokens, but we can understand they're tokens of everything to express our gratitude, our appreciation, our respect. So, it, and so it's, it's dynamic because the particularity is a token of this, but also the particularity is a token of everything. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this out. See, she's, they're helping me. Rep, yes. do you need any help? I need help with everything. And you're helping me with the, with the microphone. Thank you. I guess I'm also thinking about um, token and when I'm doing something or making an offering that it's always kind of token because it cannot reach what it is that I, you know, wish to offer. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like Linda just said, we offer flowers as a token of our appreciation, but the flowers don't actually reach it. At the same time, we're offering it as what we can't reach. So I offer flowers as a token of what I can't reach. And also I offer it as what I can't reach. Yes. And it's like a ceremony. It's a ceremony. That's correct. And what, when you were talking about asking for... Could you hold the microphone a little bit farther away? When you were talking about it, thank you. When you were talking about uh, asking for help or talking about not do like doing it on your own um you know that phrase of uh you can't um you don't do it by yourself but no one can do it for you mm -hmm. kind of arose in me and um, i guess i'm wondering about the part that is kind of like personal responsibility um in the context of not being able to do things on your own or the reality that we're all doing this together. You're asking about the relationship between responsibility and the teaching that we don't do things on our own? So I, I feel like I have a responsibility to, to express that I can't do things on my own. And my expression, as I express, for example, that I can't do things on my own, when I make that expression, I also remember I didn't do that on my own. And often do, when I do express that, I feel like I'm expressing it because I was asked to express it. I couldn't actually express it until that person requested me to say, I can't do this on my own. I can't do this practice on my own. You have, I need your help. I'm responsible to tell you when I feel something like I need your help. Right now, I feel really good about saying to people, I need your help. I think I could do that more. But again, I didn't think these thoughts by myself. You, you drew them out of me. You pulled them out by your offering to me. I needed you to, so I could respond to your question. And, I'm, I, and I feel responsibility to live that way. And it sounds like it's not also just not sitting down, making effort. It's at the effort is like asking for help, but also making an effort also at yeah. the same time. I'm an, I'm, an effort, I'm an effortful being, and so are you. And because I'm an effortful being, I need to make effort. Mm -hmm. And also the effort I make, I'm helped. I cannot do the effort which I'm expressing by myself. 
So it's, uh, it's an effort in concert. It's an effort in context. It's a guided effort. In concert. Mm -hmm. In concert. With all. In concert. With all beings. All. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. <laughs> and um, I wanted help <laughs> understanding uh, what is so important about the exactitude of the posture. You know, for example, if my posture isn't quite as prescribed, how is that not quite offering the token or inviting the same? Samadhi. I wouldn't, I don't feel like the um, exactitude is what is important. I think the exact, the exactitude of a form is an opportunity to realize that we're not doing it by ourselves. It's a, it's a point of, it's a point where the form is expressed this way. And there's another being who is, who's, who's with us practicing it. And the, the exactitude gives them a, a, what do you call it? A conversation piece. So your your practice is a conversation piece, but the fact that there's a, a traditional way of doing it tunes into the practice, the, the conversation opportunity. That's what's really important. It's the conversation, not the form. We could have different forms here, and in different Zen schools, they they do this form of walking somewhat different. Like some have the hands sort of uh, like this, and some turn them so that the palm is down. So there's different forms, but all of them are opportunities for this intimate communion. And if, the, if there's no particular way of doing it that's been sat, handed down, it may be difficult to say anything. Like Suzuki Roshi used to say, when I see you at a party or something, you all look the same. But when I see you in the zendo, you all look different. Because each person is doing the form in a different way. And he can see that. And so he can relate to each person through that subtle variation or that unique expression of a particular form which is quite definite. But it isn't that we should line up and be that definite thing. It's that the definiteness of it offers a way for each of us to see how we're relating to it and other people to see how we're relating to it and to dance with that and see if we can do that in a way that's uplifting and liberating rather than trying to tell people to be this way and get them to be that way, which we will, of course, never succeed at anyway. But we're not trying to do that. We're patiently trying to converse with people about these forms. And we, we might actually occasionally, we have, might have a wish that these forms would actually look the way they're traditionally done someday. But that would be another thing to converse about. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, may, have you helped me enough? Well, somebody else wants to help. OK. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. You're welcome. Um, my question is, if somebody uh, asks me for help, if I give out an answer or I give out a token, how do you know it's a right one for this person? Because sometimes I feel you don't know it's if it's a good advisor or not. Um. I'm having a little problem hearing it. Would you mind if someone else rephrased it? Or... Please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I heard you say, uh, ask the question, um, if, if you're giving a token, if you want to help someone, uh, how do you know if it's actually what you're giving, what you're offering is actually helpful or not? I don't. I don't know. I do not know. If it's the right token to offer or not. I don't know. I do not know. 
that's part of offering a token is that it isn't this token is is the right token and it's you know it's going to have the right effect it just this is my offering i don't i don't know that my gifts will be helpful do i want them to be helpful yes i bet i don't know that they are i do not know how my gift will actually work for the situation but i want it to be really beneficial and uh, yeah like right now, I want this to be helpful to you, but I don't know if it will. And, but I, and I'm not just offering it to help you, I'm offering it to help everybody. I, I do want to help you. I want, what I, I want my life to be helpful to you, but not just for you. I want it to help everybody. <laughs> Somebody said to me one time, do you love me? And I said, mm-hmm. And they said, but you say that to everybody, right? I said, mm-hmm. So I want to help you, but I want to help everybody. And I, please accept that, that I'm not just wanting to help you, even though I really do. And also, I don't know if I'm helping you and everybody, but that's my bodhisattva vow. And I want feedback. And people sometimes say that was helpful or that wasn't. And that also is part of my ongoing experience of people telling me that was or that wasn't. But when they tell me it wasn't, it doesn't mean I know it wasn't. And if they tell me it was, it doesn't mean now I know it was. I do not know. So excuse me, but I'll tell this story one more time. One time a friend of mine, and as a matter of fact, it just happened to be one of these 90-year-olds that I visited on Tuesday. I visited two 90-year-old friends. And one of, this, one of these friends had told me quite a while ago, he said, you don't know how you help people. You don't know how you're helping people. You also don't know your, the impact of your teaching, he said to me years ago. And when he said that to me, I thought, that's right, I don't. I don't know how I'm helping people. I have some idea. I heard somebody say I did, but that's not necessarily how I'm helping. That's just what they said. And then he told me an example of how I helped that I didn't know anything about. But when, he, but, but when he told me that, I thought, I still don't know how I help people. I just know that that's a story that he told me about how I'm helping people. And I didn't know about it. So, the story, I'll, I'll try to tell it not too long. It's a story about these people going to a jeweler and this woman and a friend of hers were picking out wedding rings. She was about to get married. And she went to a jeweler and she wanted a certain kind of a jewel in her wedding ring. I think she wanted a sapphire of a certain shape. And the jeweler was showing her these different sapphires and she was asking to see more examples. And he became impatient with her. And she, and then the Buddha, I would say the Buddha came to help her. She saw a Buddha on the shelf in his shop. And she said, uh, are you a Buddhist? Do you practice Buddhism? And she, he said, yes. And uh, she said, oh, well, we're going to have a, uh, a wedding at a Zen center. And, um, and the jeweler said, well, who's going to perform the wedding? And, and then she told him my name, and he said, oh, he's my teacher. Please don't tell him that I've been impatient with you. And then he started being really kind to her. And, you know, not, you know, showing her all the things, and she got just the ring she was looking for. And then they told me that story. That's an, she's, as an example of, I didn't know how I was helping her. And, and I still don't. But when she told the story recently, I saw a new aspect of it, was that in that story, it wasn't just me that was helping. Also, the Buddha on the shelf was helping. And also, her questioning of him, do you practice? You know, and telling him that she was getting married, and telling him who was going to perform the ceremony, all that is what made it helpful. 
so I still don't know. But this is a good example of how we are helping and don't know. We're, we're trying to discover how we actually are helping. And we have various ideas, but they don't reach the help. Our ideas are a token of the help. And so our ideas can also be great offerings of everything to the reality of what we're doing. And I also just want to mention, just so we don't forget, that our, the person who's standing, his name is Valerian. He's, as you know, he's the director of this meditation hall. And he's been, he's now shrinking down. <laughs> He's the director of the meditation hall, and he's been doing a wonderful job for eons. And, but he's going to leave. And next Sunday might be his last Sunday, is that right? This Sunday might be my last Yeah. Sunday. This Sunday might be his last Sunday of taking care of all of us. All these, all these, all these, all these Sundays, and all these Saturdays, and Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. He's been doing all this. And... Uh, Thank you so much, Valerian. We will miss you. And uh, the next Eno will also be a wonderful Eno. <laughs> clapping, we're clapping before she starts. That's great. <laughs> so thank you, Valerian. And uh, thank you all for helping me. Helping me with what? Helping me to just sit. Helping me with what? The Buddha way. <laughs> I'm laughing because I just thought of another song, but I don't want to press my luck. <laughs>